We have built this evening's forum around one of our country's greatest and most distinguished historians, Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., who honors us all by his presence here on the Kennedy Library stage. Arthur. A Pulitzer Prize winner before he turned 30, Arthur has been an interpreter of American democracy for nearly six decades. He burst on the scene as a young Harvard historian in 1945 when he published The Age of Jackson, a book that is still regarded as a model of presidential history. And I want, to know, I want you to know that we did a little digging in the archives of the Kennedy Library and found that uh, in 1947, two years later, Arthur Schlesinger was named one of ten outstanding young men of the year by the American Chamber of Commerce, and he was in good company that year because the other, one of the other young men of the year was a freshman member of Congress named John F. Kennedy. Over the years, Arthur became a friend of the Kennedys, and in 1960, he joined the Kennedy campaign, working hard to persuade Stevenson liberals that it was time for them to switch. In the Kennedy White House, he helped recruit some of the finest talent in the country to join the new administration. And as a presidential counselor, he helped shape the president's agenda and became an intellectual force behind many aspects of the new frontier. Later, in his second Pulitzer Prize winning book, A Thousand Days, Arthur captured the magic and promise and accomplishments of the Kennedy era and then in 1979, his poignant study of Robert F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy and his times received the National Book Award. Over the years, Arthur Schlesinger has been heralded both as an historian and as a participant in history. In the latest of his 16 books, War and the American Presidency, uh, he writes as a citizen historian, sharing with us decades of wisdom and experience about how presidents act in times of crisis and how democracy is strained in times of war. And as you'll no doubt hear tonight, Arthur certainly does not hesitate to offer his own opinion about what's happening today. So if timing matters as much in history as it does in politics, I must say, Arthur, war and the American presidency is headed right to the top of the bestseller list. And I should say in a plug for the author that he has kindly agreed to sign copies uh, in our bookstore after this uh, forum. Our other two panelists and our moderator tonight have written about or worked for every American president since John F. Kennedy. Kevin Phillips first became known for his 1967 book, The Emerging Republican Majority, which predicted a new era of Republican control of the presidency based on a realignment of the South. Like Arthur Schlesinger, Kevin Phillips was an enfant terrible at the age of 27, writing the book known as the political Bible of the Nixon administration. He served briefly as special assistant to Attorney General John Mitchell, and then, might I say, wisely left in 1970 to become a syndicated newspaper columnist. For more than three decades, Kevin Phillips has been one of our country's most astute political analysts. Always ahead of conventional wisdom, he has published hundreds of columns and 11 books on American social and political change. In 1993, the New York Times Book Review noted that, quote, through more than 25 years of analysis and predictions, nobody has been as transcendentally right about the outlines of American political change as Kevin Phillips how one can be transcendentally right. We all need to <laughs> understand more. Over the last decade, he has focused on the decline of the middle class and the relationship between wealth and democracy, staking out yet another uncharted area of political analysis. Tom Wicker has been one of America's most trusted and thoughtful journalists for more than 40 years. He served as Washington bureau chief of the New York Times during the Johnson administration and the growing buildup of the Vietnam War and as a New York Times columnist throughout the Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, and George H.W. Bush administrations, helping the nation understand the great events of our time, including the Civil Rights Revolution, Vietnam, Watergate, the Cold War, and the fall of the Berlin Wall.
Tom was born in Hamlet, North Carolina. Maybe he'll tell us a little more about Hamlet and got his start in journalism on the ground floor working for the Sand Hill Citizen, the Lumberton Robesonian, the Winston-Salem Journal, and the Nashville Tennessean before joining the New York Times in 1960. He is the author of several books about the presidents he covered, including One of Us, Richard Nixon and the American Dream, JFK and LBJ, and Kennedy Without Tears. Our moderator tonight is David Gergen, a frequent speaker at Kennedy Library Forums. David brings to tonight's forum his long and unique experience in the White House as an advisor to four presidents, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Ronald Reagan, and Bill Clinton, where I might just say parenthetically, we served together when I was an Assistant Secretary of State. I was privileged to work with David. David captured these extremely diverse American leaders in his 2000 book, Eyewitness to Power, The Essence of Leadership from Nixon to Clinton, which established him as an astute inside observer of the presidency. Today, David is Professor of Public Service and Director of the Center for Public Leadership at the John F. Kennedy School of Government and also editor-at-large at U.S. News and World Report. I can say with authority in introducing him that he traces his career as a journalist and a public servant to the days when we were both at Yale together, and he was the managing editor of the Yale Daily News in 1963 on the eve of the modern era of Yale presidents, <laughs> starting with Bill Clinton and then George Bush, with perhaps more to follow. Please join me in welcoming to the stage of the Kennedy Library, Arthur Schlesinger, Kevin Phillips, Tom Wicker, and David Gergen. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you all for joining us, and we want to also welcome the listening audience beyond uh, to this occasion. Uh, it is, uh, uh, one should say, and, and as, as by way of introduction, uh, that many of us are here today because of the inspired leadership of John Shattuck uh, at the Kennedy Library. He has brought, he's revived and, I think, invigorated the intellectual life of this library so that what happens in this forum so well matches many of the documents and the books that uh, are here in the library. We want to welcome all of you as part of that. <laughs> it's a daunting prospect to sit here with these three distinguished and prolific uh, authors uh, uh, to talk First and foremost, we'll talk some about. I'd like to talk to Arthur Schlesinger about his most recent book, *War and the American Presidency*, which helps to stimulate this. But as I thought about the book that uh, Kevin has just written on uh, President McKinley as part of the Schlesinger series, and Tom Wicker has just written a biography of President Eisenhower, and thought about what it was going to be like to be talking here, I, I'm reminded that when authors go on book tours they will frequently tell you that they meet two different types of interviewers. First, there's the interviewer who has never read your book. <laughs> and then there's the interviewer who has never read any book. <coughs> I, 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 prefer, I confess to being in the first category. <coughs> But if I, if I might, uh, I, I, I must say, and as I, what I did have a chance to read of the Arthur, Arthur's book on the way here in the last couple of days, um, it's striking how much of this ought to be read by the, the, uh, the Kerry and uh, uh, Edwards uh, debate, camp, uh, debate teams. There are so many points in here and quotes from the Federalist Papers and from other documents, Arthur, I thought I kept, you, you better ship one down to uh, these folks because the answer to whether there ought to be an international standard for the conduct of war is right here in the Federalist Papers, as far as I can tell. Uh, the, uh, so let me, if I might, what I'd like to do, Arthur, is ask you first, if you would, sir, to um, walk us through the, the, the major premise of your book. Uh, and then perhaps we could talk for just a few minutes to flesh it out. And then I'd like to ask... Uh, 
Kevin and Tom Wicker if they would then join that conversation. And then around 6.30 or so, just a little after, we'll turn to you all here in the, uh, in the audience and, uh, and, and invite your questions. So Arthur, tell us uh, why, this, why this newest book and your, your, the major points that you would like to make from it. I thought that there are many excellent books about the war in, in, in Iraq, but they are instant history. They, they lack a historical dimension. William Faulkner once said, the past is never dead, it's not even past. And the endeavor of, of this book is to supply the historical background for current policies and current controversies. I think that, for example, President Bush, who is much underrated as, as a leader, executed a 180-degree reversal in the U.S., uh, the basis of U.S. foreign policy. Both President Truman and President Eisenhower explicitly rejected the whole concept of preventive war in favor of the combination of containment and deterrence, which won us the Cold War. Eisenhower, when asked by Scotty Reston at a press conference whether he believed in preventive war, really shot Scotty out of the out of the water, and in, in his indignant rejection of preventive war. But yet, in the in the, during the Cold War, people who argued for preventive war were regarded as loonies. And fortunately, they never came to power in any major democracy or major communist state. But President Bush rejected the, the, the containment and deterrence mix, and, and without igniting a national debate on the question, committed us to the policy of, of preventive war. I would, they called it the Eisenhower administration, I mean the Bush administration, called it preemptive war because preventive war had a very bad sense. But it's preemptive war. I think the distinction which is often blurred between preventive, preemptive war which is uh, hovers on the margin of legality. The, the Preemptive war was ably defined by Secretary of State Daniel Webster in 1841, and which leaves the rapidity and the urgency of the attack leaves no choice but to avert it. Incontrovertible evidence, but. Preventive war is based on speculation about the intentions and capabilities of the enemy. Perfectibility of intelligence is the basis of preventive war, but we know now how defective our intelligence resources have been, particularly in the Middle East, 
And nonetheless, President Bush is unrepentant in his advocacy of, of preventive war. If he, if he is reelected, I think he would regard that as an endorsement of his methods and purposes. Already, there are threats and warnings directed at Iran, which are eerily reminiscent of the threats and warnings directed against Iraq before President Bush launched his invasion. And uh, I, I, the only way to avert the prospect of preventive wars launched ad libitum is a regime change in Washington. I had been uncertain whether you could hear well. It's clear that you can. <laughs> you can't? Can you hear? Can you, if you, can you raise your hand if you cannot clear hear well? So, if you cannot hear well. Thank you. <laughs> we can hear you fine, just fine, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Arthur, let me ask you this question. Uh, perhaps if we could, yes, the move, the, they moved the microphone a little closer to you. That's great. Uh, you do make the point that the Bush uh, doctrine, as you call it, uh, does recall an earlier period of American history, that there was a period much in much of our early history when we were much more unilateral in approach. And I would assume, for example, when James Polk went to war, with Mexico that it has a preventive character to that war. The unilateral unilateralism is the oldest doctrine in American foreign policy. Washington in his farewell address attacked the warned against the uh, permanent alliances. Jefferson in his Inaugural, first inaugural address warned against entangling alliances. Freedom of action, freedom of choice was the standard tradition in American foreign policy until the First World War. First World War gave a new birth to a new concept of collective security. And now that the U.S. has joined the great has joined the great powers of the world, the, the, there is a value for the value for collective security, and there was a notion that international the alliances and international institutions could protect the national security of the United States and would serve the national interest. FDR, who combined the talents, the idealism of Woodrow Wilson and the geopolitical realism of Theodore Roosevelt, moved ahead. And, and, but he was fearful, fearful that we would revert to isolationism. In fact, unilateralism is divided into two schools. There is one school of unilateral isolationists led by Pat Buchanan, who is opposed to the Iraq war. And there is another school of unilateral interventionists led by Paul Wolfowitz and Cheney and who believe that the, who seem to believe that the United States is omnipotent and omniscient. I hope some of you, my remarks are, have been heard by the audience. 
I, I, I think so. Let, let me uh, ask you this, uh, 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 so I want to be clear about this. You do cite John Locke for the proposition of the emergency prerogative of a state to act when it is uh, in self-defense in an emergency, and that, in your judgment, is acceptable. What you are distinguishing is is self-defense and when it, when somebody's coming at you versus a preventive war when you're only speculating about the possibility of another country attacking you. Yeah. And it first is acceptable in your view. Yes. I, for example, was in full support of the Afghan war. Mm-hmm. The Afghan war. And uh, if George Bush had settled for, the, the, as he had maintained as his top priority, the overthrow of the Taliban and the smashing of Al Qaeda. We today, the Al Qaeda w- would probably be eliminated, and uh, the fu- function of the infrastructure for a stabilized Afghanistan might well have been laid. But uh, instead, President Bush launched an invasion of Iraq, which was not connected with international terrorism, and which left both Afghanistan as a minor mess and Iraq as a major mess. But I was in I would have stuck along with Bush if he kept uh, the Afghanistan as his top priority. Tom Wicker, uh, your thoughts, please, sir. I noticed you were sitting there with a book on Lincoln. <laughs> well, the, in the absence of any uh, of any thoughts of my own, you can always turn to Lincoln. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I just thought in in uh, in support of what. Arthur was saying, I think the useful distinction between preemptive and preventive war, uh, I believe, and I ask this uh, as a matter of clarification, not in a matter of advocacy on my part, but I think many in the administration today would say, well, that was all very well in 1841, but the fact of the matter is when you can be attacked across the, uh, uh, the poles by missiles, when communications are instantaneous and so forth, you can no longer wait. In fact, I believe President Bush has said you can no longer wait to be attacked as we were at Pearl Harbor. I don't believe anyone uh, thinks that we should not have responded to the Pearl Harbor attack. But the current administration, President Bush, would say you can't wait for that now. And I, I would think under his doctrine, uh, you almost would have attacked Japan first yes. instead of they attacking us yes. first. Well, I had... We know, had, had we intercepted the Japanese fleet, task force, 250 miles from Hawaii, we would have, that would be preemptive war, because they were steaming to, for Hawaii for Pearl, in order to destroy the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. But there is no question about the, uh, the preemptive strike in that case. But, but Tom, coming back to you then, uh, let me ask you, you've, you have known, covered, and been thoroughly familiar with presidents from Eisenhower on, I believe. Yes. Uh, do you think that they face with the threats of terrorism uh, and that, that are very real? And the people in Homeland Security and Center for Disease Control, after all, are terribly, terribly concerned about attacks that could uh, take out 100,000 Americans. I mean, they have scenarios that are very believable. Under those circumstances, do you think other presidents would have been reluctant to uh, embrace the idea of preemptive or perhaps even preventive war? I, I, it's very difficult to try to think what some other president would have done. I I wouldn't want to say that no other president would have adopted the idea of preventive war. I believe in the circumstances of uh, several years ago, uh, 
I, don't, I can't think of any president other than George W. Bush, the current president, who would have acted on those circumstances in the name of preventive war, which is not quite the same as saying that uh, you reject that doctrine uh, in, in general. But uh, I think the question here is, uh, would another president, let us say Eisenhower or let us say Ronald Reagan, uh, would he have ordered the invasion of Iraq on the information that he had, right. whether or not he believed in, 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 in the long-term idea of preventive war. And I don't believe he would have. That is my, is my own judgment. But, uh, e even though the Congress during the Clinton administration did adopt a, 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 you know, a law saying regime change was American policy. That, that was before Bush came to office. Regime yeah, yeah. change in Iraq. Yes, but regime change and invasion are not necessarily the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, how, how different would it, you, you've written a book on President Eisenhower, how different is it to use the CIA uh, to, uh, uh, to pull off a coup in Guatemala or to pull off a coup in Iran? Well, I don't think it's very different. Indeed, uh, in everything I've written about Eisenhower, uh, which, which, with which I'm sure many people disagree, I have regarded the coups in uh, Guatemala and Iran as being entirely illegitimate. Mm -hmm. But are they in some ways rooted in the same notion that America can use its power as it sees fit? No, I think particularly Iran, it was rooted in the notion that we can't allow another communist power to come, another communist government to come into power. I don't believe anyone uh, in, uh, what was it, 1953, believed that Iran was about to attack the United States, certainly not Guatemala. <laughs> Kevin Phillips, your views, sir. Well, just going back and looking at the Republican president since World War II, I would say probably the endorsement of Kerry by uh, John Eisenhower, President Eisenhower's son. And I have every reason to think that uh, his son, David Eisenhower, and, and his wife, Julie Nixon Eisenhower, feel the same way as their father. Uh, we, we've seen, for anybody who happened to read Kitty Kelly, one little sidebar to this is that the Reagans and the Bushes have never been able to stand each other. And, you know, my guess is that uh, the people really close to Ronald Reagan would, would say, well, you know, he wouldn't have done that sort of thing either. I, it's just hard for me to see that this isn't a total move away from the views of the three pre-Bush Republican presidents. Now, let me interject quickly a, a, another notion in here. It's really that, in a sense, this is the first dynastic war in the United States, the first father and son war in American history. And this is a nuance that doesn't get enough attention because, quite obviously, we've seen this year that all the revelations about how Bush was just hungering to go after Iraq. And the whole pressure was, you know, like sort of, tell me Osama bin Laden is an Iraqi, you know, or something like that. <laughs> because, as he said to a Texas audience in 2002, they tried to kill my dad on an assassination plot in Kuwait in 1993 against George H.W. And I think there was one. Um, but the nuance here to me that's so striking is if you look at the way George Sr. gets a good press for being much more measured in his approach. However, the difficulty is, if you go back and you look at the 80s, there was a, a scandal that became known as a rack gate about how the, uh, the Reagan-Bush administration uh, was involved in building up Iraq. In the beginning, as a counterpoint to Iran, because they were in a war, Iraq and Iran, from 1980 to 88. But then when George Bush Sr. became president in 1989, the war between Iraq and Iran was over. And he tilted very, very sharply towards Saddam and was building up Saddam. And then Saddam sort of thought he had his ticket punched for a little further than the train went, and he invaded Kuwait. And this was actually Ross Perot charged as much in the 1992 debates. He said that they built him up and they gave him the green light to just nibble at Kuwait, the Romelia oil fields in the north. Well, the other thing that happened during this first round of the Iraqi war 
was that uh, George Sr., as part of his desire to build a congressional coalition to support going into, uh, going into Iraq, uh, he came up with, uh, through one of the PR firms in Washington, what turned out to be the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador reported that she had seen when Iraq invaded Kuwait, the 312 premature babies were ripped out of incubators. Well, it turned out it was, they made it up. It was one of the Washington PR firms that had connections to the Bush administration. And there was also, it's been alleged, and I think with some proof, that the Bush administration misrepresented the proximity of Iraqi tanks as a threat to Saudi Arabia. So why are we surprised that when the next Bush gets in there, he regards that as the priority as opposed to Afghanistan or Osama bin Laden? It gives speech after speech in which they, they mix up a 9-11 in Iraq you know, 9-11 and Saddam Hussein. I mean, there have been studies of this. It's clear. The whole misrepresentation of weapons of mass destruction is akin to the misrepresentations that were there but didn't get a lot of attention back in 1990 and 91. So I think the dynastic aspect of this really trumps the notion of preemptive, preventive, whatever we want to call it, because in the mind of George W., there's something larger at work here. It's partly oil, partly family, partly religion, but it's much more than just a doctrine of striking. Let me uh, ask you, uh, let's go back to Arthur's point. He said that the uh, that if the president is reelected, uh, that he, he might well regard this as a, an endorsement of his approach. I'm, I'm wondering if the three of you think that, indeed, if he is reelected, Others, such as the Europeans, would could properly or appropriately conclude uh, that the president's policies have been endorsed, and that this is not. You know, there's been in, in a lot of the international opinion about over the last few years, and of souring, we've seen a number of Europeans and others say, "Well, it's, we like America, we just don't like this administration." If 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 the America re reelects the president. Will Europe, can Europe appropriately conclude, you know, he spoke for America and his policies and he's just been endorsed. And do, do his policies then have a form of legitimacy in a second term if he does decide he has to take action in a place like Iran or elsewhere? Within the historical context, has he been given, in effect, a blessing, uh, an approval? by the country, which strengthens, strengthens his hand to go forward with the policy. I'm just curious how, to, how we should interpret this election, because after all, we're now essentially four weeks and one day from that verdict. I think he, he would regard it as a national mandate, because he, in spite of the, he's a, he's a shrewd politico, and in spite of the dispute over the election two of 2000, he acted as president as if he had won by a landslide. And 9-11 uh, pre presidentialized him in a way. And uh, I think he would execute the wishes of the American people as endorsed by his re-election. I think the impact on the rest of the world would be wretched. Wretched? Is that the wretched. word you used? Yes. Uh, ne never in American history has have the United States been so unpopular abroad as it is, is today, never before in American history. The, this is ironic in view of the wave of international sympathy that was engulfed the United States after 9-11. But within three years, President Bush has turned it all around and made American policy disliked, distrusted, and even hated. The 
John F. Kennedy said, America is neither omniscient nor omnipotent. We are only 6% of the world's policy, the world's population, and we cannot impose our will upon the other 94%. Therefore, there cannot be an American solution to every world problem. I think the re-election of President Bush would signal to the world that there is an American solution to every world problem. Do you, do you think, Arthur, that it also would clothe him with greater, greater legitimacy uh, in terms of going forward? I mean, is, if, he, if he is, after all, endorsed by his fellow countrymen, why could he not walk away from that saying, you know, I, I, by the standards of American history, I've now been given a mandate to continue? I think he would claim that, but I think the reaction abroad would be to draw the reports from abroad draw a distinction between the American people and their, and their president. The distrust, dislike, and hatred would be extended from the president to the embrace the American people. Tom? Uh, it's very difficult, as we said, to anticipate or to know what some other president would have done. And, of course, you can't really know what the feeling would be abroad. But I think uh, if uh, it has something to do with uh, how the election goes, I mean, a mandate is not 50.01% to 49.9%. And who knows? I don't believe that uh, the European nations would accept that as a mandate I mean, the nations of the world would accept that as a mandate, whereas an overwhelming victory for President Bush might well be accepted. Now, I think Arthur is right that based on the experience of 2000, of the year 2000, that uh, President Bush is going to claim a mandate no matter how narrow it is. And that might wash in the United States, but I don't think that uh, mm -hmm. if he has a really very narrow, razor blade thin majority or victory, uh, that it will be accepted in Germany and France, perhaps even in Britain, that somehow the United States has swung around from the policy of collective security to a policy of preventive war. I don't believe that would be regarded as a mandate abroad, even if it's claimed as a mandate in the White House. That's interesting. I will tell you that during the Republican Convention, I spoke to one of the President's top strategists, political strategists, and he said we would regard a victory as a mandate for an aggressive foreign policy in the second term. I'm that, sure they that, would. That, that, is their, would be, that is their intended interpretation. Yeah. Kevin? Well, I think the big X factors in this are three. The first is how big a vote George W. gets. Let's suppose that he wins, but he has only 49.3 percent, and Kerry has 48 point something, mm -hmm. and Nader and the, the fringe have got the rest. Uh, Clinton suffered during his second term from not having reached 50 percent. I think it inhibited him somewhat. Uh, I think if Bush can't reach 50 after the little 5-4 Supreme Court decision uh, four years ago, it is the responsibility of the media in the United States. Now, parenthetically, I have to chuckle. Chuckle. <laughs> The responsibility of the media in the United States <laughs> uh, uh, to point out exactly what went on here in terms of the electoral pattern and what issue was raised and when and the total fecklessness. Most of you, I'm sure, are Democrats. The total fecklessness of the Democratic Party in not opposing these things, in not discussing the way in which George W. was playing his own games. Kerry finally, in the debate, got up there and said something. But part of why the media have had nothing to say is that so many Democrats have nothing to say. They're practicing invertebrate life. Uh, I wanted to go back to the question of that has now come, become part of the national debate. It was... So, and, and, and Senator Kerry talked about this in the first presidential debate, and now President Bush has challenged him on it, and that is whether there ought to be some sort of international standard 
uh, as he, as, a, as the senator put it, for the, uh, in the determination of whether America does go to war, whether a president should refer to international sentiment. The senator said there ought to be two standard, two elements to the standard. One is that it's a policy that's clearly understood and supported by the American people. And secondly, it's a, before you go to war, it should be there should be enough evidence to convince the international community that this is a worthy effort in effect. And I wanted to ask whether that, that, that does echo Federalist 63 that you cite in your, in your book, Arthur. And I wanted to ask about, is there such an international standard? Have we traditionally or not, tradi- not do we traditionally observe that, or is that something we talk about but don't observe historically? Well, we began by the Declaration of Independence and including a phrase, a decent respect, for the opinions of mankind, and that has been the motto, the watchword. Though presidents often conceal their actions, the co- uh, particularly covert action in the course of the book, I mentioned the deceit and dissembling of the, and the use of secret agents which took place in the first half century of the Republic. But they did not claim uh, the presidents deceived the Congress and deceived the people because they did not claim authority to do that. And therefore they had to conceal it. The uh, the where Bush has broken away from the crowd is is claim the inherent authority and uh, for to 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 to, to use every technique, every tactic to because of the. Challenge of ter- terrorism. So I think that uh, the Bush doctrine does not has its precedence in in American history, but never formally stated and never claimed as a right as an, inher- as an inher- inherent power of the presidency. Tom. I was. I think there's one element of this that uh, goes beyond the doctrine, let's say, of preventive war. I think it's the doctrine that the president, whether preemptively or preventively, as we might, that the president has the power to take the nation into war because he thinks it's the right thing to do. I believe you can trace something of a straight line from the Eisenhower administration's resolution on the Middle East, which gave power to the president, Now, he did not use it, and we didn't have a war then. Eisenhower, in many ways, was a wise man. Uh, To the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, which gave the power to make war uh, in Vietnam to Lyndon Johnson, and he did use it. To the current resolution, which gave President Bush the power to make war. He didn't specify Iraq, but the power to make war. And I think what's happened, and it seems to me to be very dangerous, is that in, in uh, in that half century, uh, Congress has very nearly ceded the power to make war to the president, whereas the Constitution specifies that Congress shall declare war. We haven't had a declaration of war in in that sense, a congressional declaration of war since World War II when we were attacked. And I think that uh, as much as the conceivable shift in, in national outlook towards preventive war I don't believe there is such a thing, but it's conceivable. I think that's less dangerous in many ways than the idea that all of a sudden the president is empowered to make war when when uh, when he can get 51 percent of the members of Congress to agree. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't understand one point you just made, Tom. But you said it was conceivable, but you didn't think it was likely. I to shift. it's conceivable that there's been some national shift in opinion towards preventing Prevent war. war. I see. Uh, I don't personally happen to believe that, but I think it is conceivable. Mm-hmm. You might read that letter from Lincoln to Herndon. You mean I'm going to be invited to read from Lincoln <laughs> after I brought it? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, um, 
this is at the time of the uh, Mexican War, although I don't think it necessarily refers to that. And Lincoln is replying. This is a letter from Lincoln to his law partner, William H. Herndon. Who's, and Lincoln says, quote, Allow the president to invade a neighboring nation. And Iraq was a neighboring nation. Allow the president to invade a neighboring nation whenever he shall deem it necessary to repel an invasion. And you allow him to do so whenever he may choose to say he deems it necessary for, per for such purpose. And you allow him to make war at pleasure. Steady to see, he advises Herndon, steady to see if you can fix any limit to his power in this respect after you have given him so much as you propose. If today he should choose to say he thinks it necessary to invade Canada to prevent the British from invading us, how can you stop him? You may say to him, I see no probability of the British invading us, but he will say to you, be silent. I'll see it if you don't. <laughs> It, it, that, that passage is striking about Lincoln. It's also worth remembering that, 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 that Lincoln darn near destroyed, destroyed his political career by taking that stand uh, against Polk. Right. But uh, but he, but he, but he stood up. Right. Yeah, right. He stood up. He, it, it did stand up over time in history. Kevin, I want to come back to you, Tom, just a minute about one other thing. But, Kevin, your view on this, uh, uh, the, the supineness of Congress, and, and has it essentially ceded uh, uh, almost full power, uh, uh, its war-making powers from Article One to the Congress? I think over the course of the Korean War, Vietnam, the various sort of police actions and retaliatory raids in the 1980s and then the Gulf War and then Iraq, that the whole question of what's a war and what requires consent and what consent is and what Congress has to do has been so muddied that it's not uh, an effective pond in which you, you look to measure things. I would say, and in this sense I think Kerry is right, that it's important to talk about something that sits well internationally. Now, what I don't mean, and probably he didn't mean, is that you know, it doesn't matter if you annoy the French and the Swedes or something like that. But if what you have cooked up is so stupid, <laughs> partly because you didn't take any classes when you were in the Texas Air National Guard, you know, um, but if what you have cooked up is so stupid that you're basically offending the, the rank and file members of one of the world's major religions by your terminology and your actions and defiling their holy places and that your action becomes a recruiting poster for the terrorists you purport to be against. That is a, a lack of awareness of international opinion. The, the Pew Center did some incredible polling in Muslim countries as to what they thought. In almost every Muslim country, the support for Osama bin Laden was far ahead of for George W. They, they, in the beginning, they tried to pretend it wasn't the United States and that it was George W. So I think there's a perfectly reasonable yardstick to apply that you have to be, you have to have media and politicians and, and people in academia or whatever who will stand up and voice these issues. I, mean, I don't care whether the French aren't happy, it doesn't make any difference. But if it's so foolish as to transgress on major international forces and in a public opinion that has the capacity to just totally overwhelm us in, in the, uh, the terrorist situation, that's foolishness. That's a responsibility you have to be held to. And he got away with doing something that paid no attention to world opinion in that sense. Tom, let me come back to you for a second. The... Uh just for fairness, there, I, I'm sure there are some people here who may have a different view about and want to defend the president. I want to make sure uh, that there is that opportunity uh, uh, available before this is over. Uh, but I want to, I'm going to come to the floor here in just a minute, but I want to cover a couple of other things, if we might. Tom, in, in, in reading Arthur Schlesinger's new book, I was reminded once again that there was a time in the middle of the 20th century with starting with Franklin Roosevelt and moving on through Truman and certainly with Dwight Eisenhower you've just studied that there, there the leadership of the country professed publicly even though they might abrogate this in, in ways in Guatemala and Iran but there was a large commitment 
to, to international law, to international norms, and uh, a belief that American security lay in international organizations such as the United Nations. So Eisenhower would frequently say, and when a crisis broke out somewhere, let's take it to the UN. Or he'd want to go to the UN for Adams for Peace. Or when the Berlin crisis, or the Suez crisis. He always wanted to, his first instinct, let's take it to the UN. Yes. How have we wandered from that standard? I mean, we seem to be so far from the belief. Our, our law schools were basically quiet on the question of international law as we approached the Iraq war. It wasn't just the Congress or the Democrats. We heard very little about the role of international law and international norms. How have we wandered or departed so far from that mid-century tradition? Well, that's a question, to be perfectly frank with you, I can't answer it because I don't feel that, uh, I don't feel that we should have drifted from that if we have. Uh, you can say, and President Bush, the current President Bush, would say, well, I went to the U.N. Of course, he went to the U.N. dragged, kicking, and screaming. And uh, then when he didn't get the vote that he wanted, uh, he did, did what he had intended to do all along. I think that's a fair interpretation, although some may disagree with it. But I'm, I'm wondering... What would have happened in, your, in the thesis you just put forward if President Eisenhower had taken an issue, let's say Suez, to uh, the U.N. and been voted down? Hmm. Now, he probably would not have been in the first place because Eisenhower was a majestic figure by comparison to, uh, to the current president <laughs> or almost any president. Uh, and he probably would not have been because that was a case, although it was dis a disputed case, it was a case that I think did, as Arthur put it, respect the decent opinion of mankind. Uh, whether or not if Eisenhower had suffered an actual defeat in the Security Council, yeah. whether he would have continued to oppose the British-French invasion of Suez, I don't know. I think he would have. Um, this is my judgment of the man and the situation, because he really felt that, that was, they were the ones who were offending the decent opinion of mankind. The British and the French in their invasion of Suez. Arthur, is it in our national interest or not to cede some sovereignty to international bodies such as the United Nations in order to establish a system of checks and balances internationally? Are we better off with checks and balances or are we better off as a power that says when it's convenient we'll accept the checks and balances but if we think our national security is somehow endangered, thank you very much. We're not going to wait for your veto. I think that we cannot achieve any of our major objectives in the world without allies and in international institutions. Mm -hmm. And I think that this does not mean ceding our sovereignty to France or any other country, but... Uh, it be, because FDR anticipating this problem it instituted the device of the veto, the great power of veto, the National Security Council, so that there is... But should the, should the Security Council have a veto over us? Uh, no. It all depends on the case, circumstances. But uh, if... We want to go to war, and the, and the Security Council of the UN disapproves of that, that war. They have no legal right, no legal power over the. But we w would be well advised to get, reconsider. Hmm. I, I think that's that's the case. I, I don't know of any American who would advocate giving sovereignty in a well, hard sense to, to the Security Council. But on the other hand, it seems to me that uh, their decision expressed in an actual vote of actual countries is something that really ought to be regarded very seriously uh, in the mm -hmm. White House and Congress. Sure. But the European nations have, in effect, ceded pieces of their sovereignty to the EU. Uh, in some aspects, I don't believe of their on policy. national security, mm -hmm. on currency matters, and that kind of thing. Yes, but mm -hmm. I, I, I don't believe they've ceded sovereignty. And if so, uh, I don't think they would 
admit it when the crunch, when the crunch comes. <laughs> Kevin. Well, I think the question as to whether or not uh, Americans want to give sovereignty away to international bodies has been pretty clearly answered by the, uh, the debate and the attempt by the president to go back and, and attack Kerry for proposing, you know, even listen to what people say overseas, as well as a number of other things having to do with everything from international courts to uh, Kyoto and what have you. There's no desire to give away sovereignty. I wouldn't fight any debate on that basis. I would raise a very different question. There's sovereignty and there's sovereignty. Now, we're talking about political sovereignty in the most pure sense, whether it's international law or uh, a union that takes away your own national ability to make your decisions. But there's another problem that Americans have that has been massively aided and abetted by the administration. It's loss of economic sovereignty. The United States is at a point where uh, the current account deficit, which is the largest measure of international um, negative transfers and trade and indebtedness, uh, is up to 5.3% of GDP, may, may go to 6 or more. Well, after World War II, it was when the, the British current account deficit went up to between 6 and 7% that the pound sterling fell apart. Now, if some of you have been watching the Fannie Mae mess in Washington and other things like that, it's not just Treasury bonds that they hold in Asia. They have a lot of Fannies and Freddies, which are the two government uh, uh, managed, connected, whatever you want to call them, associations. If people want to dump dollars, we're the world's leading debtor. I don't see how you can possibly have an intelligent government, that is the problem, uh, that makes a decision that you're going to be just a loose cannon in, in the military and international sense, with no sense that anybody can touch you. While you're, you have this enormous Achilles heel, in the sense of the current account deficit, the requirement that we rely on, on foreign purchases of government bonds, even the great danger from the Fannie Mae and the other notes in, in East Asia. I mean, that's, that's sovereignty. We've given away some financial sovereignty in a big way. You would think they might be concerned about. So I'm just saying there's sovereignty and there's sovereignty. Don't fight the wrong debate politically. Fight the debate on which they are 99-pound weaklings on the beach in that, that old ad of yesteryear. Huh. Um, there are two microphones here. I'm going to ask, while you're, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, come to the microphones now. We'll get through as many as we can in the, in the next few minutes. But I'd like to ask one other question while you're lining up, uh, and that is about the role of dissent during a time of, of war. Uh, it's one thing to say the Democrats should have stood up and fought against the Iraq war, but once we've gone, I'm trying to figure out what is the appropriate role of dissent. The president and his spokespeople have made a heavy argument against Kerry and others, saying you're undermining our troops, the immorale of our troops, by calling us the wrong war the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, and there's almost an implied, if it's not just implied by some of the critics, uh, that this is unpatriotic to be dissenting once the troops are on the ground. It's one thing to argue about it before they go, but once they're on the ground and their lives are at stake, uh, that, that the political opposition should support the troops. I, I'm just, what, what is the, what does our history tell us about that, Arthur? Well, I think the, for example, Lincoln opposed the Mexican War, but voted for supplies for the troops. I'm sorry, he was always? He, he, he opposed the Mexican War, but he voted for supplies for the troops. Some, President Bush would say John Kerry's done just the opposite. The, <laughs> he, he, he refused to vote for the supplies for the troops when he voted against the $87 billion. Yeah, but that was a... A confusing vote. <laughs> but I think Theodore Roosevelt, for example, in 1917 or 18, said it was morally treasonable, I have this quote in the book, morally treasonable for all criticism of the president to cease. Senator Robert A. Taft Mr. Republican, two weeks after Pearl Harbor, 
said the notion that criticism means it gives aid and comfort to the enemy. I'm, Taft said I would be quite willing to give aid and comfort to the enemy for a few moments, but the, the, the criticism of the, of the president should not cease because it will improve our fighting strength and the free, dis free discussion will save the country from fatal mistakes. First question. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Joe Guzman, and I'm a student at the Kennedy School of Government. I'm honored to be in the presence of such great Americans, uh, and therefore I, I humbly disagree. <laughs> In the late 1930s, there was a, a policy for Europe of appeasement. There's only one man who really went against that strongly, a British politician. And there were discussions in boards like this that ostracized him, vilified him, and cast him aside from politics. That man's name was Winston Churchill. But his, his vision and his conviction to stick to that vision now result in a democratic Germany and Japan. If President Bush's vision and his conviction to stick to such vision succeeds, and democracy and freedom can be established in the Middle East, how do you think history will view him? I'll concede that he's not the politician that Churchill was, but, <laughs> but can you submit that the vision and the conviction to stick to such vision is a worthy cause, especially if freedom will result in the Middle East? Thank you. This, the question or comment is based on the sub premise that Saddam Hussein, who was as great a threat to the United States and the civilized world as Adolf Hitler. That premise seems to me nonsense. <laughs> Osama bin Laden is as great, if not more, of a threat to the United States than Hitler was. If, if I may just add uh, to Arthur's comment, and without going to the premises about it, uh, it seemed to, it seemed to me to be a very distant proposition that we're going to wind up with a democratic Iraq. Now, if a democratic <laughs> Iraq uh, does result, uh, and particularly a democratic Middle East in the larger sense, does result from this warfare, then I think uh, you would be entirely entitled to come back and ask this panel, panel that question. At the moment, I think it's very what Franklin Roosevelt used to call an iffy question. <laughs> Thank you. Well, far from uh, Iraq being the, the same force and player on the world scene that, that Germany was, there's also an enormous difference in terms of the military awareness levels of, of Churchill and then George W. People forget that Winston Churchill passed out of Sandhurst pretty near the top of his class. He was a uh, uh, subaltern in the 4th Hussars and participated in the last cavalry charge of uh, the British Army in Abdurman, uh, uh, most notable military achievement of George W. was apparently to have danced somewhat unclothed on a bar outside one of the Air Force bases. Uh, no, I'm serious. He doesn't have any credentials in military anything, and you're talking about a country, Iraq, that even in the time of the Gulf War had a, a gross domestic product the size of Kentucky. This isn't some Germany. You can't pretend that anybody there is another Hitler. I mean, not unless you're a Bush and you're trying to cook up a phony. Thank you. I'll, I'll come back in 30 years and ask you the same question. Thank you. <laughs> Please. Uh, I don't know how to follow a boxer with uh, playing t-ball, but basically, thank you for coming. And I just want to know, as someone who's begun studying international law, when there's not treaties or some long-standing accepted doctrine for countries to follow, courts and leaders throughout history have looked to international customary law and international custom as the formation or basis of law. And so while I can't answer, you know, why law schools haven't weighed in on this subject as much as in the past in terms of wars, um, I wonder what your perspective on the formation of or if it's in the infancy of an international custom or customary law in terms of preemptive or preventive warfare. 
and whether, finally, that, uh, it's gaining or not gaining acceptance. Is, is, to add to that, is the United States uh, in favor of preemptive war by other nations, that they should have that right as well? Oh. What, isn't that? No. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I'm not saying whether it's the U.S., ver, you know, look, in terms of the rest of the world or the rest of the world in terms of the U.S., I'm saying in terms of international custom, uh, you know, whether it be war, um, law of the seas, things like that, which have developed by either necessity or the times, whether the same thing could be ongoing right now. Well, I think the United States is beginning to uh, allow some of its allies or sort of allies like Russia to um, begin to indulge some of these preemptive and, and I want to knock them off, so we're going to knock them off. Because if you want them to support and not make any noises about your possible violation of international law, loose as it is or custom or whatever, you've got to permit it. And is there a is an old concept in the law called an easement, the right to walk or travel across a certain area. And I think the United States is beginning to create easements in international law for the behavior of, of some, some countries. Uh, Israel and Palestine is probably one, the Russians in, in some places, and I'm sure there'll be more. And we're not going to say too much because we don't want to be called on what we've done. Please, please, sir. My name is Nick Rudin. I'm with uh, the Kennedy School of Government. I'm a student. I'm just wondering, with respect to Osama bin Laden, um, we've been talking a lot of, uh, about a lot of really big issues that um, seem very important, but say Osama bin Laden is captured before November 2nd, how much will that cloud these issues that we've been discussing um, with respect to preemptive and premeditative, and, um, and also should it should it inform our opinions on these issues? Political pessimists believe that Karl Rove already has Osama bin Laden <laughs> in a cave somewhere <laughs> and will spring him the week before the election. Yeah, I think it would be a very, very major electoral effect, let's put it that way. If it happened... Uh, say a week from now, I think it would be enormously effective. If it got too close to the election, you could get a backlash. Tom? No, I, I agree with, with, with Kevin, but I was also saying that I think it's possible, uh, beyond the political effect, that we can put too much emphasis on Osama bin Laden as being the enemy. I have no question that he is an enemy, but there are a lot of enemies out there. And I think uh, just as with uh, the capture of Saddam Hussein, that did not end uh, resistance in, uh, in Iraq. And I don't think uh, capture of Osama bin Laden, whatever political effect it might have in this country, uh, would have much effect on the so-called uh, uh, war or crisis of terrorism. I think that would yeah. go on. Please. Hi, gentlemen. I'm George Zelius. I go to Emanuel College. And I was just wondering... You said Eisenhower uh, always used to say, let's take it to the UN, let's take it to the UN. Do you think that had anything to do with the fact that there was another superpower to constrain us in our actions? And it wasn't that we just, we were, we were morally righteous at that time and we knew it was right for us? Do you think it was because of the power set up in the world? Well, today we are the only, the sole superpower, so there's nothing to constrain us. If there was something there, or do you think that our power is an illusion, which is sort of what you were implying with our, our, our uh, debt there, where we had six, we're up to, almost going to get up to six percent or something. Is it an illusion up how? Is it? Is it just because there's not another superpower to check us? Please, I can leap in there. I, th I think the fact that there was another superpower had everything to do with that. A bipolar world, a world of two superpowers, uh, or perhaps even more, but certainly a world of two superpowers is very different from a world of only one superpower. Uh, I would, uh, I would think that um, much of the uh, so-called uh, neocon foreign policy, if, that, if that's an accurate phrase, uh, can only exist where there's only one superpower. And I happen to think, I believe I wrote it one time or another, that's, I'm sorry to call me your attention to that, but that, <laughs> that uh, a, a unipolar world as compared to the bipolar world that we once had is one of the worst things that ever happened to us in terms of our politics, not necessarily in terms of security. 
But uh, I think since uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, we really never have had a full sense of exactly what kind of policy we ought to be following. Huh, that's, uh, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Um, I, I wanted to follow up. Let me just ask you briefly about that, Kevin. Uh, uh, you very kindly came to t- talk to uh, Kennedy School class that Elaine K. Mark and I have. Uh, and you talked, you, you said you thought we might be in the first, the early stages of declinism uh, as a great power as you look at history. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, but part of the the thing that matters here is that it's always been very anticipatory in in countries that are in this role, whether it be Rome or the the Dutch in the 17th century or or the British in the late 19th and early 20th, because you start to see technical signs in trade and manufacturing and other things that you're peaking at a point in time when your actual military and global prowess is still growing. So it's not a clear, every dimension moves at the same time. But I think the United States, at least there's a fair possibility that the period we're in right now is going to be seen as a watershed of not having taken advantage of 9-11 in the long-term constructive way and of having dissipated that opportunity by dissipating the geopolitical advantage and going into Iraq and setting ourselves up, much as I think the British were bled to death fiscally by World Wars I and II, uh, we've already seen what effect it's had on the deficit. Uh, the current account deficit's worse. I think it's entirely possible that we're starting to see additional stages of decline, like some of our military posturing doesn't work because we can't handle the, the ground warfare and a... Uh, a terrorist or third world situation that we're overextended fiscally, that uh, a government system doesn't work all that well. And I think that's true, although people would debate that. All of these yardsticks w- would suggest to me that the United States is now past its peak as you would measure it in terms of all dimensions of strength. And historically, it's always been downhill from there. You can go up a bit, but then you go down more, and nobody's ever beaten the problem. Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, I have a question. We, this is sort of a related question, talking about taking it to the U.N. 50 years ago as opposed to not necessarily doing it today. But wouldn't it be fair to say that the U.N. today is different? Mm-hmm. For example, they'll condemn Israelis' actions against the Palestinian, but don't condemn with the same virulence the um, actions of Palestinians against Israel, so that the, the moral authority of the U.N. is not the same as it is as it was 50 years ago. Or, or as, a, as the conservatives, like Bill Sapphire would say, the oil for food scandal uh, at the U.N. Is, uh, only proves the bankruptcy of the U.N. as an institution from his perspective. Arthur Schlesinger. Well, I think the U.N. is an imperfect organization, but it's better than not having a U.N. And I think one reason is that the it's ironic, again, The founders of the U.N. were Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt. And and nothing has more weakened the U.N. than the obvious contempt which the presidency of George Bush holds for the U.N. in the house of the founders. I think if we discharge our financial obligations to the U.N. and strengthened it, we would have, the U.N. would be far more useful. But it does not have a rapid response for us. It does not have uh, the oil for food scandal has weakened it. It, uh, They sent an excellent team to Baghdad and the, the chief and the deputy chief were killed, and uh, Kofi Annan withdrew the, the UN force. So I think we cannot, partly because of our own actions, dump everything on the UN. They are technically incapable of, of presently of discharging 
the difficult task. Good evening, John. Thank you very much. Um, I just recently heard Jim Garrison's America as Empire. And in that, he described uh, the possibility of America's living in a world of fear. And it also is touched upon in The Unfinished Life by Robert Dalek. Um, how would you respond to that, how Americans are just living in a world of fear, and that's why we're in Iraq and such other points as that? How would you respond? Well, I think of the whole question of American empire as if the America had an empire comparable to the British Empire of the 19th century, the French Empire of the, of the 19th century, uh, the Roman Empire. Those were real empires. We are perfectly in, incompetent imperialists, as we are showing in Iraq today. <coughs> We, whereas the British and the French in the 19th century recreated in India, in Indochina, in South Africa, in Kenya and Uganda, in French Equatorial Africa, recreated the, 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 the world of France and, and Britain. They sent their younger sons out to man the outposts of empire. We were in the Philippines for 30 or 40 years. Does anyone know of an American who settled in the Philippines? It's still, and also, we tend to become the, the client, we tend to become the victims of client states on whom we depend on whom we keep alive. For example, in the 1960s, we were the captive of South Vietnam, of Saigon, because we, for internal political reasons, we could not withdraw, pull out, we felt. And therefore, they, because they, we did not have the ultimate sanction of authority or withdrawal, we became the prison captives of the Saigon regime. For 30 years, we've been the, the captives of the Israeli Foreign Office. Tel Aviv, like Saigon, for internal political reasons, we it's a this is, is this an empire? God knows. It's a feeble imitation of the French and British empires of the 19th century. That may be a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Please. Can I make one point here? I don't know that there's any thermometer or yardstick or scale on which you measure national fear, uh, but... Uh, and I'm not a very good judge. I live over in Vermont, and that's not a very fearful state at all. But, <laughs> but I would say, having lived through the 50s, when for the first time the United States, uh, even in Missouri, uh, the internal, the heartland, so-called, realized it could be reached by missiles from, from a foreign country, I'm not sure we live more in an age of fear and anxiety today than we did in, uh, in the 1950s, when school children were taught what to do, taught wrongly, what to do in case uh, an atomic bomb exploded. Uh, I think uh, fear in that sense is, is relative, and it seems to me, at least maybe in my clouded memory, that uh, the 50s were more, much more nearly a, an age of fear than today. Yeah, uh, we're going to try to get through uh, a couple more questions if we can. But, I, Kevin, I wanted to follow, ask you to follow up about the politics. You, you mentioned in class a little earlier that you thought we might be moving toward a garrison-type politics. Well, I think the danger in terms of some of the permutations of politics, uh, there is the potential for a, a garrison state politics to work if there's enough fear of terrorism because people will want to suspend some of these protections that they feel just get in the way of finding the terrorists. So I think that's one aspect of it. There is another aspect of, uh, of imperialism, the empire we have, is, is not a, necessarily a shadow of the British and French empires. 
it, it comes in a different form. The United States is interested in controlling almost every major source of petroleum in, in the world. And in terms of the extent to which American foreign policy is, is arranged to, to try to make at least a, a friendly sphere of influence for the United States in, in petroleum political geography, or to really have almost a semi-colonial relationship, whether it's in uh, Mexico or Equatorial Guinea or, or Saudi Arabia or the, some of the states in the Persian Gulf. We have a little bit of an empire there. It's a very vulnerable empire, but it's certainly an empire. And you, all you have to do is go through American foreign policy and see really back 50, even 60 years, FDR in, in the 1940s saying that we had a stake in Saudi Arabia at that point. We certainly did. So there, there are a lot of nuances to all these things. I think politics is being perverted in a sense towards accepting elements of a garrison state because we're unduly concerned about things. I mean, just to wind up on another note, uh, it was quite clear that during the Civil War, people were able to conduct politics in border states, even though armies were going back and forth and they were, they were raided, there were uh, all kinds of things happening that would make terrorism look like an inadequate description. But Kentucky and Missouri and all these states, Pennsylvania was able to function while the Confederates were raiding into it. Um, we lack a historical perspective on this, and the administration has been able to seize it and define it. And again, there's no historical uh, larger construct here. Yes, sir. Um, my name is O'Neill Anderson. I go to O'Brien and my classmates, and I want to know... Um, in your opinion, if Kerry won the election, do you think he would take some of the troops out of Iraq? It's a good question. <clears throat> Who would like to respond to that? If Kerry is elected, will he start taking troops out of Iraq? You worried about getting drafted? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe that he has said that he would hope to have all the troops home within four years. That doesn't answer the question of what he might do next January or February. But uh, I don't believe that there's going to be any uh, withdrawal of troops under either president until we see what happens in January, if anything does, in the, in the Iraqi elections. After that, uh, depending on how the election goes, if there is an election, I repeat the if, um, then I think uh, the question of troop withdrawals become more relevant, more imperative in a way. Yes, sir. Uh, I am Leonard Halpert. I live in Boston. I'm, re uh, uh, I'm retired, but not a tired old gentleman. My question for the panel is, uh, what standard should our leaders apply and we as citizens consider, assuming we know the facts, that uh, determine whether this country should engage in either a preventative, a preventive or preemptive war. Uh, many uh, commentators have suggested that the well-known First Amendment doctrine of imminent danger is the standard to be applied, and if I may paraphrase that, that the there is an imminent danger that the substantive evil that we fear will occur uh, will occur and therefore preventive or uh, uh, preemptive action should be taken. Thank you. That's a good question. Dr. Schlesinger. I do not think clear and present danger can be certified by prophecy. By prophecy. Prophecy. You, you want to uh, uh, unpack that <laughs> with one or two more sentences? <laughs> well, the administration, the Bush presidency, has prophesied about the wicked intentions of Saddam Hussein and his government in Iraq. It's a thin basis to 
like the Oracle in Delphi. I, uh, speculation and prophecy and prediction are uh, history thwarts them all. And uh, the, uh, the possibilities of history, possibilities of circumstance and development are bound to frustrate the most eloquent of prophets. In Italia from Roxbury Community College, I would like to thank the presenters for the wonderful presentations. My, my question is what strategies are in place to help the American citizens to understand the traditions. You have just mentioned some of the traditions and you even went further to, narrate, to elaborate about the pre 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 preemptive war and preventive war. Because like, right now we have a, a big challenge in the world whereby different countries are f having difficulties or calamities like the floods and um, different storms which have been striking different parts of the Caribbean. And the world over we have been looking at America to be one of the strongest economies of the world to respond to such uh, situations. So what, uh, what solutions or what measures do you think we can or can be used through the politicians and other means? I did not hear the question. I'm afraid I didn't, I didn't quite. Did you understand? Not sure that I have the exact focus, but I think it's very difficult for the United States to function. Uh, you're raising questions of the calamities in the Caribbean and elsewhere in the world. The United States doesn't really plan to deal with these, does to some small extent, um, but there's nothing organized in that dimension, whereas obviously in the whole history of almost all of the world is to organize a lot more with respect to wars and wealth and resources and, and that sort of thing as opposed to calamities. I don't think that's exactly what you asked, but that's a general reaction. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I can... <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> this, this brings us to a close. I want to thank John Shattuck again. I especially want to thank, if we could, this panel. I, I can only imagine how much John Kennedy would enjoy the idea of Arthur Schlesinger coming here tonight with Tom Wicker and Kevin Phillips. Thank you all three of you gentlemen. Thank you.